Well, it's so good to look out and see all of you here. And if you're a guest this morning, th thank you for being here. We're honored that you've chosen to worship with us today. Pastor Weaver, our, our uh, founding pastor, senior pastor, is out this weekend. He and Susan are out. So I'd, sometimes I forget to, to say that. And people are saying, where's, where's Pastor Weaver? Pray for them. They're just out uh, having some time away. So uh, keep them in your prayers. And uh, thank you for being a, an amazing church. Thank you for being patient with us. Uh, we're excited about Sunday school and our Wednesday night activities starting. Wednesday activities begin this week. As you go out, if you didn't get one of these yet, there is a brochure that kind of gives you all of the classes for adults uh, that are uh, available. And Sunday school is going to start when it starts next week. This time period is where all of our kids and youth will get Sunday school. So this is the only time for elementary and preschool to have Sunday school. And uh, so if you're, if you're here for this time, uh, you can stay for a Sunday school class at 11, or you can come early and get a class during the 8 o'clock time, and then come to church here. Uh, if your kids are doing Sunday school during this time, you, you can um, be in Sunday school when they're in church. Is that confusing to everybody? There is a little bit of a map. So we're in three, three services, the schedule, and we, there's no way at this point that we can go back and still kind of keep some distance. So this is our attempt at doing Sunday school while we have three services. So this brochure will help you a little bit. It'll give the different class offerings during the 8 o'clock hour, the 9.30, and the 11 o'clock hour. So, and if you look at that and say, well, my Sunday school class that I want to attend is at 9.30. Well, you can do 9.30, come to the 8 o'clock service, do 9.30 Sunday school, come to the 11 o'clock service. So... I'll let, we'll let you guys figure that out. If you want me to tell you where to go, just call me. I'll, I'll, I'll uh, do the best I can. <laughs> yeah, I know it's, but we're excited just to have those opportunities for people to get back together uh, in uh, connecting relationally and uh, discipleship. It's one of the things that we value. It's one of our core values is discipleship, uh, teaching, and uh, relationships. And this is the biggest vehicle that we have of doing that. So thank you for being patient with us. And uh, this morning, uh, you're hearing from me. This is the last sermon in the series on biblical worldview. We, this is the fourth and final message in this series. If you haven't been here, we've been talking about having a biblical worldview. And before I go any further, I just want to say welcome to all you who are joining us online and to those who are joining in our mask on service over in the auditorium. Thank you for being here today and joining us today. We're excited that you, all of us are able to be together uh, for church. We're scattered all over the city, all over the state, and really all over the world because we have people joining us from countries all over the world, which is exciting, exciting for us. But this morning, the message that I want to share for you, final message in this Biblical World series, um, a biblical worldview. It's how we view our lives and the world around us. And we need to be viewing that through the lens of the perspective of the Bible, of Scripture, who God is. Because if we don't have an intentional biblical worldview, then we're just going to adapt the worldview of the, of the culture around us, which is, which is secular, humanistic, socialism, whatever it might be. Uh, and unfortunately, as we've looked at the statistics from George Barnes' study that he did, uh, the culture is having more of an influence on the church than the church having an influence on our culture. And God has called us to be salt and light. We're to, we're to be making a difference. And so how we view the world and what we do and how we view our lives, it's important that we look at it through the perspective of Scripture. What does the Scripture tell us about who God is and what he wants and expects for our lives. So we've looked at these uh, topics. We looked at biblical accuracy, that the Bible is clear in the principles that it teaches, and it's accurate and true. We talked about Jesus being the only way to heaven. Jesus isn't just a way. He is the only way. As we read scripture, that's the only conclusion that we can come to, that it's only through Jesus that we can get to God. We can't earn our way to heaven. We believe that Jesus lived a sinless life here on earth. He was crucified. He died on a cross. He took our place and took our sin upon himself. He was buried. Three days later, he rose from the from the dead, and he overcame death, hell, the grave, and he lives today. He sits at the right hand of the Father. Last week, we, we talked about absolute moral truth. Truth, by our culture, they say it's relative. That you can believe, and you have your truth, I have my truth, they could be t completely different, but somehow we're both right. I don't understand that. That just doesn't make sense to me. 
We, we've come to this place to realize and agree that there is such a thing as absolute moral truth. Things that are true, that are always true, have always been true, will always be true, no matter where you're at, what culture you're in, what time period you're in. It's true, true, true. And we know that Jesus is not only the way, but he is the truth. And he is the life. So, today we're looking at this biblical worldview statement that God is all-powerful, all-knowing, and he still rules in the world today. So in George Barna's study that was done uh, a few years ago, 70% of Americans agree with this statement. 93% of born-again Christians agree with this statement that God is all-powerful, all-knowing, and he rules in the world today. So you're saying, why would we spend time on this statement? It seems pretty amazing. You know, when we've looked at some of these um, some of these statements, and we look at overall that only 19% of those who identify as born-again Christians have a true biblical worldview. But 93% agree with this statement. How many of you would say you agree, agree and believe that God is all-powerful, that he knows everything, and that he's in charge and ruling the world today? If, you, if 93% of you agree, we're right on with stats. I hope that we all agree with that because that is true. It is true. We're going to be looking at, at that statement today and unpacking that a little bit. The scripture that I want to use as our foundational scripture is Psalm 145 or 147 verse 5. And this is what the psalmist says. How great is our God. His power is absolute. His understanding beyond comprehension. So it speaks to God's power and his understanding, his power and what he knows, that he is all-knowing and that he is all-powerful. His power is absolute. He is mighty in power, he is abundant in strength, and he is, his understanding is beyond comprehension. It's infinite. It is limitless. It has no limits. So today I want to talk about these two things, God's omniscience, and that's a theological word, you're not going to find that in the Bible, but it just is a word, omni, that means all, science, which talks about knowing, Om, omniscient, he is all-knowing, omnipotent, he is all-powerful, omnipresent, he is everywhere at the same time. We're going to look at omniscience, God's omniscience, and God's omnipotence today. So when we say that God is omniscient, what we're saying is that God knows everything, everything that there is to know. Everything that is possible, everything that is actual. God knows all things that are real and potential. He knows, he knows them all at the same time. He knows what was, what is, and he knows what will be. And on top of that, he knows everything that could be, but is not. His knowledge is absolute, it's instinctive, it's full, it's complete, it's perfect, it's infinite. God knows no thing better than any other thing, but all things equally well. He never discovers anything. He's never surprised. He's never amazed. He never wonders about anything because he knows everything. And he knows how everything fits together. He knows the end from the beginning. He knows the past, the present, and the future. So there's a lot that God knows. Uh, if you were to um, make your objective to read every book in the library, and let's just take the Urbandale Library, I have no idea how many volumes there are. I looked on the website, and there's a little bit of history about the Urbandale Library. And at that point, there was, I don't know, 20,000 volumes in the Urbandale Library. Um, and you said, okay, I'm just going to make it my goal to, to read all the books in the library. You would realize in a hurry that you would have to make this your life's work. If this is what you were to do eight hours a day, you would discover that a lifetime isn't enough to read all the books in the Urban Dell Library because if you were to read one book a day, how many of you read a book a day? You know, we have book clubs that read a book a month. Some book clubs read a book a week. But if we were to read a book a day, it would take more than a lifetime to do so. And when you think of the Library of Congress, evidently there is... I saw a number that said 25, 25 million books in the, that are cataloged in the Library of Congress. When you add all of the other works or whatever that are not bound as books, but you just start doing the math. If you were to read a book a day, it would take you like 60,000 years 
to read all the books in the Library of Congress. That's like almost 800 lifetimes of reading, and that's assuming that you're reading from the day you were born till the day that you die, and you lived an average of 79.8 uh, years of age, which is the average age of the life of an American. One, we know that you're not reading from day one. Maybe you did, I don't know. Um, but that's a, lot of, that's a lot of reading. And that's just to gain the knowledge that's bound in books. God knows all of that and so much more. That's the point that I'm trying to make to you. His understanding is infinite, he has no limit, he's beyond comprehension because God knows everything, nothing is hidden from him. We may not know God very well, but he knows us. He knows every aspect of our lives. He even knows the number of hairs on your head. Some of you, that's not hard. <laughs> less and less for me all the time. All those that are watching on the camera, you can see it's pretty thin up there. But they say that the average person has 100,000 hairs on their head. And the scripture tells us that God knows every one of those hairs. He has them numbered. So if there's seven and a half billion people on earth, and you multiply that times 100,000 hairs on every head, that's seven and a half quadrillion hairs, and God is intimately acquainted with each and every one of them. He's got them numbered. That, I mean, it just helps us to see that it's, it's amazing and kind of blows our mind what God knows. I want you to listen to what the psalmist David says in response to God's knowledge of him. Psalm 139, starting with verse 1. O oh Lord, you have examined my heart and you know everything about me. You know when I sit down and stand up. You know my thoughts even when I'm far away. You see me when I travel and when I rest at home. You know everything I do. You know what I'm going to say even before I say it, Lord. You go before me and follow me. You place your hand of blessing on my head. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too great for me to understand. David's saying, look, you are so intimately acquainted and such intimate knowledge about me and who I am. You know everything about me. Some of you are saying, I know a lot about me. And even though God knows more about me, I know enough about me. And I don't want other people to know about me. And it's kind of intimidating to know that God knows everything about me. But here's the thing about God. He knows everything about you and he loves you. He loves you so greatly, so much so that he gave his life for you. He knows you. People often mistake or misjudge our motives and our actions. But God does not. He knows the secret things that people do. He knows the condition of their hearts. No one else may know much about you, but God knows everything about you. And the Bible tells us that one day, we'll all stand before him, the one who knows everything about us, and we will have to give an account of our lives to him. Stuff he already knows. And this is a reason why we need to seek forgiveness from Jesus the one who paid the price for our sins on the cross. God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him wouldn't perish but have eternal life. For God didn't send his son into the world to condemn the world but to save the world through him. Amazing. And I think that this is a reason why we need to give our lives to him. And at the end of my message, I'm gonna give opportunity for those who don't know Jesus as Savior and Lord of their lives to give your lives to God, to ask him to forgive you of your sins and make him Lord of your life and save your life. You see, sometimes we feel lost, but God knows exactly where we are. We might forget about him, but he never forgets about us. We might worry about tomorrow or the next day. How many of you are anxious about the week that's coming up? Here's what I can tell you, God already knows it. And if we believe that he knows everything and he has power over everything and he's promised in his word to work it all together for our good, what do we worry about? If we truly believe that he knows it and that he can do something about it, we shouldn't fear or doubt or worry. Jesus said your father knows exactly what you need even before you ask him. Listen to this statement. What God knows about us 
is infinitely more important than what others think about us. What God knows about us is infinitely more important than what others think about us. And here's, here's what I'll say. We spend a lot of time, a lot of time and energy, our efforts, based on what others think about us. But what God knows about us is infinitely more important than what other people think about us. We have a God who is all-knowing. He knows everything. There's nothing outside of his realm of knowledge. Not only is he all-knowing, but he's all-powerful. The word, like I said, omnipotent, which means that his power is infinite and unlimited. The word om- omnipotent isn't in the Bible, except in the King James Version, Revelation 19.6, says, hallelujah, for the God, our God omnipotent reigneth. But in every other place, 340 times in, 345 times in Scripture is the word almighty. In the, in the Old Testament, in the Hebrew, it's Shaddai, El Shaddai, God the all-powerful one. In the New Testament, it is Pantocrator. It's the Greek word for almighty. And it's only ever used for God, no one else. He is the almighty, him and him alone. Psalm 89, 8, who is like you, Lord God almighty? You, Lord, are mighty, and your faithfulness surrounds you. See, God has all the resources and his ability to work his will in every circumstance in the universe. God has that ability. A.W. Tozer said it like this, God alone is almighty. He possesses what no creature can, an incomprehensible plenitude of power, a potency that is absolute. Jeremiah chapter 32 records a prayer of the prophet Jeremiah. We're gonna look at a couple of prayers this morning. Jeremiah says this, Jeremiah 32, 17. Ah, sovereign Lord, you have made the heavens and the earth by your great power and outstretched arm. Nothing is too hard for you. It's talking about God's power, his omnipotence, omnipotency. Say that five times. And then he goes on to describe some highlights from history and, and that demonstrate God's omnipotence, beginning in, in verse 18. You are the great and mighty God whose name is the Lord Almighty. Great are your purposes and mighty are your deeds. Your eyes are open to the ways of all mankind. You reward each person according to their conduct and as their deeds deserve. You perform signs and wonders in Egypt and have continued them to this day in Israel and among all mankind and have gained the renown that is still yours. So Jeremiah is reminding himself of the God who is almighty, who is full of power, who made the heavens and the earth and nothing is too hard for him, the one who has done great wonders among mankind, whose miracles stand fixed in history. We can go back and read through the scriptures and see all the times where God created the earth. He created everything in it. And he started with nothing. He created something out of nothing. We read about how he parted the Red Sea and they walked across the sea on dry ground, how he shut the mouths of lions in the, in the den when Daniel was in the den of lions. He caused a virgin to conceive a child. Think about this. He fed 5,000 with a couple of loaves and some fish. He worked miracle after miracle, and we still tell those stories today. And I know that he's worked in our lives as well. Every one of us has a story, hopefully, uh, about God's power in our life. How many of you have a story? Something miraculous God did, or it's just one of those things that you say, that's not coincidence. It had to be the hand of God that provided in that way. We, we should have story after story of things that God has done in our lives, and we need to recount those stories as well. So then in verse 27, God answers Jeremiah's prayer. It says, then the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah, and God said this, I am the Lord, the God of all mankind. Is anything too hard for me? And so God is urging Jeremiah to greater faith by taking his statement, Jeremiah's statement, that nothing is too difficult for you. And he turns that around and restates it in the form of a question to Jeremiah. And what he's saying is this, Jeremiah, do you really believe what you just said? Do you really believe that nothing is too difficult for God? 
and he says it like this, is anything too hard for me? It's the same thing that, that, that God said to Sarah when she doubted God's promise that she would have a son. You see, Sarah knew that she was way past childbearing years. Her and Abraham both were way too old, and the scripture says that when she heard that, she laughed. And so God asked Abraham, why did Sarah laugh? Why did she laugh when I said, is there anything too hard for the Lord? Or why did she say, uh, well, I really have a child now that I'm old? And he asked the same question to Abraham, is there anything too difficult for me? Similar to the response to Mary when she questioned the angel Gabriel, Luke chapter one, he told her that she had found favor with God and that she would conceive and give birth to a son and she was to call his name Jesus. And her response was, how can this happen? How could this happen? I'm still a virgin. And Gabriel said to her, the Holy Spirit will come on you. And the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Not only this, but your cousin Elizabeth is going to have a child in her old age. For nothing is impossible with God. Over and over, God is proving himself to be able to do the impossible things. And so he turns this question around to, to, to Jeremiah, and God asks the same question to Abraham, and I believe he's asking the same question of us today. Is anything too difficult for God? Is anything too difficult for God? I want to get very practical as we, as we kind of bring this to an end here. Um, where, where our life is really at, where the rubber meets the road, so to speak. Most of us, I believe, if we're honest, we agree with these statements. God is all-powerful. He's all-knowing. 70% of Americans, like I said, agree with that statement. 93% of born-again believers agree with that statement. But our problem is like Jeremiah's. Do we really believe it? Do we really believe that nothing is too hard for God? If we say that we believe that, how is it affecting our lives and the way that we live, what we do, and what we say? Do we experience the power of God in our lives on a regular, daily basis? Do we experience God's power in our life? Is anything too hard for the Lord? I want to look at a few scriptures, the first one being Acts 1-8, where it says, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Listen, God equips us for the tasks that he calls us to. He is all powerful and he makes us a power available to each and every one of us. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. How many of you have experienced that power You've experienced the power of God in your life and you say, I know that it's only because of God. It's only what God has done in my life. It's only what God's done through my life. This, at the beginning of Acts, is how they did amazing things. Take some time to read Acts if you haven't in a while and let it just build faith in you of what God can do through the power of the Holy Spirit in his people. Take the disciples who were hiding. They were in the upper room like God told them to. Jesus said, go and wait. They were waiting there day after day for 10 days. And the Holy Spirit came in such a powerful way. Talks about tongues of fire that came on their heads. They began speaking languages that they never knew. There was a sound like a wind that went through the place. And everything changed from that moment on. The church started. Peter stood up, preached a sermon. 3,000 people were saved that day. And amazing, and amazing things happened after that because of the power of the Holy Spirit in their lives. How many of us are accessing the power of the Holy Spirit on a daily basis in our lives? Because I believe if we're accessing the power of the Holy Spirit, then we won't be nervous about what's going to happen tomorrow or on election day or a year from now. Any of that. We believe that God has the power, we believe that God has the knowledge, and we're trusting him. I heard Pastor Brian ask you guys earlier, do you trust God? And it was about a half of an applause. Do we really trust God? Okay, I, I'm not looking for a pep rally answer here. I'm just saying, we believe that he's powerful. We believe that he knows everything. Why wouldn't we trust him? him? 
He gives us power to live godly lives. Too many of us have settled for a mediocre Christian life. We believed and we fooled ourselves into thinking that yeah, we'll, we'll never be able to change or my husband will never change or my kids will never change. Kids, you might think your parents will never change. That's probably true. <laughs> but we'll make excuses for ourselves sometimes and just say, well, that's just the way that I am. You know, I've got a temper or I've got, I've got anger issues or I just this or I just that. I can't help myself. It's a bad habit, some kind of a hang-up. Many of us give lip service to God, but we live our lives in our own strength. And the reality is, is we come up way short. And that's not the way that God intends for us to live. Jesus said in John 15, 5, apart from me, you can do nothing. Paul said in Philippians 4, 13, I can do all things through Christ who gives me the strength. And in Romans 8, it says, if God is for us, who can be against us? If God is for us, It's a rhetorical question. No one, no thing can be against us if God is for us. And it goes on to say, we are more than conquerors through Christ who loved us. Ephesians chapter one is a prayer from the heart of Paul. And this is what he prays about God's power. He said, I pray that your hearts will be flooded with light so that you can understand the confident hope he has given to those he called his holy people who are his rich and glorious inheritance. I also pray that you will understand the incredible greatness of God's power for us who believe. This is the same mighty power that raised Christ from the dead and seated him in the place of honor at God's right hand in the heavenly realms. He's saying, look, this power, the same power that raised Jesus from the dead is available to us. God's power is available to us who believe in him. Do you, do you agree with that? Do you believe that? Is it happening in your lives? Romans 8, 11, the spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you. Let me ask you a couple of questions. Do you experience that same power that raised Jesus from the dead in your life? Do you know that it's there and it's available? If Christ lives in you, if the spirit of God lives in you, which if you have given your life to Jesus, you've made him Lord of your life, the Holy Spirit comes in and dwells in you. But we need to be full of his spirit. Are we experiencing that power? Do we access that power in our marriages? Or do we just believe that it's not gonna get any better? Have we lost hope that our finances will ever stabilize? How many of you have some need in your life, maybe it's a physical need, some kind of situation in your life that you need the power of God to work in your life. How many of you would say, that's you, you've got a need in your life? Just raise your hand. I got a need in my life where I need the power of God to work in my situation. We're gonna give time at the end of the message, at the end of our time this morning, we're gonna give time to pray for needs. And we're gonna believe that God's gonna meet us here. You see, with God, all things are possible. I wanna read one more prayer of Paul, Ephesians chapter three. Verse 14, and this is what Paul says. When I think of all this, I fall to my knees and I pray to the Father, the creator of everything in heaven and on earth. I pray that from his glorious, unlimited resources, he will empower you with inner strength through his spirit. Paul's saying, look, there is a power, there is a strength that is available to each and every one of you through God, through his spirit. Then Christ will make his home in your hearts as you trust in him. He will make his home in your hearts as you trust in him. Your roots will grow down into God's love and keep you strong. And may you have the power to understand, as all God's people should, how wide, how long, how high, and how deep his love is. May you experience the love of Christ, though it is too great to fully understand. And then you will be made complete with all the fullness of life and power that comes from God. Paul's saying we should expect to be full of the power and the Holy Spirit in our life. Now all glory to God who is able through his mighty power at work within us to accomplish infinitely more than we might ask or think. More than you can ask or think, it's available to you by the spirit of God that dwells in you. The same spirit that raised Christ from the dead lives in us. 
It's potential power. We just have to access it. The only way that we're going to be overcomers is to allow his spirit and his presence to live full in our lives. Listen, we don't need great faith in God. Let me say that again. You don't need great faith in God. You need faith in a great God who has all power, who knows everything, who is omnipotent. Jesus said it like this. If you had faith just the size of a grain of mustard seed, it's unlimited what can happen. It's not the quantity or the strength of our faith, but the object of our faith. Our all-powerful, almighty God who can make things happen. 2 Timothy 1, 7, God hasn't given us a spirit of fear or timidity, but a spirit of power, love, and self-control. 2 Peter 1, 3, by his divine power, God has given us everything that we need for living a godly life. Let me say this, and I'll say it very strongly. The normal Christian life is to be characterized by power for living. We've been made more than conquerors. To live an overcoming life through the power of the Holy Spirit in us. He's given us that spirit to be witnesses, to live a Christian life. He's given us that power for salvation. I want to talk to those in, in the room or who are joining us online who have not yet made Jesus Lord of your life. You're still checking Christianity out. You're searching. And your search has brought you here today. I want you to know that your life can be radically changed by the good news of Jesus Christ. This is what Paul wrote in Romans 1.16. For I am not ashamed of this good news about Christ. It's the power of God at work saving everyone who believes, the Jew first and also the Gentile. This good news tells us how God makes us right in his sight. This is accomplished from start to finish by faith. As scripture says, it is through faith that a righteous person has life. The Bible also tells us that it's by grace that we're saved, through faith. It's the free gift of God, not by works. We already determined it's not by works. It's only through Jesus. It's only through his power. It's through his life that we can be saved. The good news is that the power of God is at work to save lives. And so this morning, if you've never made Jesus Lord of your life, listen take that step and open your heart and say, Jesus, come in, forgive my sins and save me. You're accessing such a power that we can't even begin to, to comprehend his great power, his great knowledge, his great love for us. I want to invite you to close your, close your eyes, bow your heads. A word for power that he's talking about is dunamis. It's where we get the word dynamite. The gospel is the power of God. It has the power to change lives. So this morning, if you haven't made Jesus the Lord of your life, maybe you've been running, hiding, but today you're searching and you realize this is the answer telling you the search is over, you found the answer, the answer to life, what opens up the door of possibilities and potential in your life for things to work together for good. You can trust God. If that's you this morning and you're saying, I am giving my life to Jesus today, I want to invite him into my life to forgive me of my sin, to give me new life, a new life through Jesus, the hope of eternal salvation. And by hope, I'm not saying I hope to. It's, it's what we know to be true, that life comes through Jesus. And you just raise your hand and say, Pastor Jeff, that's me today. I'm inviting Jesus into my life to make him Lord of my life. With every head bowed, your eyes closed, I'm gonna look across the room starting at my right, your left. And if that's you today and you're responding to God and opening your heart to salvation, just raise your hand to say, that's me. Thank you. Right here in the middle sections, anyone? To my left, your right, there's two sections, anyone? If you 
raised your hand this morning or you're joining online and you're opening your heart to Jesus, would you just pray a prayer like this? Jesus, I invite you into my life to forgive me of my sin, to save me. I know that you are the creator. You designed my life on purpose, for a purpose. I want to experience your love, your peace, your presence, your help, true life, and power that comes through Jesus to be an overcomer in this life and in this world and to have the hope of eternal life in heaven forever with Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for dying for me, for saving me, and for forgiving me. I make you Lord in Jesus' name. This morning, if uh, you're saying that you haven't been experiencing the power of God in your life, it feels like you just keep stumbling, bumbling, like you're just struggling, fear about tomorrow. What's going to happen with this? What's going to happen with that? Anxiety about things that are going on in your life or the future, and you would say, I need the power of the Holy Spirit in my life to live an overcoming life. Listen, the power of the Spirit in your life is going to, you're not going to be able to help but be a witness. You're not going to be able to help but tell people about the hope that's inside of you. How many of you say this morning, I need the power of God that I haven't been accessing like I know I have before or like I've never experienced before, but I'm, I want to I wanna experience that power. How many of you would say that? How many of you would just raise a hand and you'd say, I need the power of God in my life like it hasn't been? Listen, he's the same. He didn't change. He didn't go anywhere. He knows right where you are. He just needs you to say, here I am. God, fill me with your spirit and with your power. I want to invite you to stand with me this morning. And here's how we're going to close. The worship team is going to lead us in prayer. But I want us to pray for needs because I know that there's people in the room, you've got situations or circumstances that you don't have answers to. And you need God's, God's help in your life. It's been a while since we've called people forward for prayer, but I want to take time to pray for needs this morning. And here's what we want to do. If you have a need in your life, listen, you don't need me or someone else to pray. You can pray. But if you want someone to join with you in prayer, we're going to ask that you just come to the altar, step out, just come down here. And if you're in these middle two sections, we'll have someone pray with you. I'm going to have my mask on, so I don't want to get anybody's face too close. But if you're not comfortable with that, but you want to come for prayer, I would encourage you to go to the, to the wings up here and you just stand and make it a, a step of faith of saying, God, I need your help in my situation. And you would just say, God, I need to meet you here. I need your help in my life. We're going to sing this song. I encourage you, if you're, if you're coming, just come with faith. And the rest of us, let's join in prayer for those that are coming. Let's believe God to work miraculously. He's been doing it all through creation, all through history. I want to see it today in our time. We live in days days where it is tough. We're in a worldwide pandemic. What is going to come out of this? It's going to come out of elections. Listen, we don't have to be fearful or anxious. God is in control. God is directing our steps. If you need prayer for anything this morning, while the worship team leads us, I invite you to come. We're going to take a few minutes, and we're going to pray and believe God to to hear us. We serve a good God who does good things. We serve a a good God who is working all things together for good to those who love him and called according to his purpose. That's Romans 8, 28. Our pain and our difficulty that we experience... Sometimes it's really difficult to believe that God can work things together for good. How many of you struggle to believe that sometimes? God, how can you bring good out of this? When are you going to bring good out of this? Will you bring good out of this? Just have a hard time trusting, a hard, hard time believing. But if we go back to believe that our God, and we have reason to believe that he is all powerful, he's omnipotent that he's all-knowing, he's omniscient, that he's omnipresent, he's everywhere 
all the time. There's nowhere that we can go where we're out of his presence. He is accessible. He has all authority, all power. We've got to believe that he's working all things together for good, even in a pandemic. Not saying he made this happen, but he will use it for his purpose and for our good. I believe that 100%. So no matter what we facing, whatever we're going through, what we need to come to realize is we need the power of God in our life every day. And I believe if we had the power of God operating in and through our lives every day, we wouldn't, we wouldn't have to try to live for God. It's just going to happen. It's who we are. An almighty God living in my body, telling me things that he, only he knows and that he has a perspective that I don't. He can speak things supernaturally to me to understand things that I wouldn't normally know. God works that way through his Holy Spirit. I gotta trust that he's leading my steps as I look to him and I'm following him. And I believe that God will use you this week. And I'm believing that this is the greatest week that you've ever had in your life. The doors will open for things that you've been ex hoping and, and praying for for a long time. We need God. We need his presence. Let me just pray a prayer before we go. Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you that you have all power. That you love us, God, with a love that is so great that we can't even begin to comprehend. But may you give us the power to know and to believe and experience the Spirit of God in us to work supernaturally through us to accomplish your purposes and your plans in this world. We're your people. You've given us access to all of this. You've given us access to your presence and to your power and to a supernatural peace that passes all understanding. May it guard every heart and every life and what you've called us and led us to. This week, God, I'm praying for an outpouring of your spirit on the lives of your people. We don't just meet with you here. God, you go with us. I know that you'll meet with us in our homes and in our neighborhoods, in our workplaces, wherever we go. Help us to be obedient to listen to your voice speaking to us and to do what you're calling us to do. God, we pray for our nation. We pray for our world that's experiencing such turmoil. And God, we pray that you would have your way in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's trust God. Let's believe him for great things. Have a great week tonight. I encourage you to come back. We have a service tonight, 6 o'clock. Time of worship in the word and we're going to spend some time praying for our nation so I encourage you to come let's pray tonight let's uh, believe God for for great things